This section of the book is on optimization, and that's the uh, modern term for maxmin problems, um, maxim problems of finding where functions attain global maxima and minima, that's as opposed to what we looked at in the last section, which was local maxima and minima. Because you care about the global situation, the second derivative test is of no use to you, really. Um, we're specifically interested in, in maxmin problems. Well, s some of the ones we'll look at are just purely math problems. But really, these have lots of applications in the real world. In real world problems, you care about minimizing the amount of material it make, takes to make a container of a certain shape or maximizing your profit um, as a function of like how much you charge for items. Um, and so we really are interested in the modeling problem also where you start with a word problem, you change it into a math problem, and then you solve the math problem. But all the modeling problems that we'll encounter in this section or yield a math problem that's here's a function, find its global maximum or minimum value. Um, it's a, a little problematic because to even know that a function has a global maximum and or global minimum value, we kind of need that the function is continuous and that the domain is compact. Um, hopefully you recall these notions from earlier in the book, but a continuous function on a compact set, compact, it's closed and bounded, so it has some boundary um, that doesn't go out infinitely far. Um, continuous functions on compact domains attain max, global maximum values and global minimum values. They can attain them at more than one point. Uh, I mean, if the global maximum could, for instance, occur at more than one point, but the global maximum value is a unique number. But in some problems, so in some of our problems, we will have a compact domain. In other problems, we'll just have to appeal to physical intuition, just kind of it's clear that there is a global maximum or global minimum, and we'll find that the function only has one critical point. And since at a global maximum or minimum, the function has to have a critical point, that one critical point must correspond to the point we're looking for. Um, let's just jump right in with an example. Let's suppose, um, so first example, a metal plate. Um, occupies the portion of the xy plane inside the circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. Rex and Y are in, let's say, meters. The temperature of the plate is given by oh, T equals 2x squared plus 2y squared minus one, uh, minus y degrees Celsius. And what do we want to do? We want find the hottest and coldest places on the plate. In fact, I phrased it as though there's a unique point where the plate is the hottest and a unique point where it's the coldest, but it could be 
that the highest temperature is attained at various points and the lowest temperature is attained at various points, but we'll see. Um, first of all, we, are, we do have a continuous function on a, on a compact set. We're looking, our metal plate sits inside here. This is a closed, bounded set. Um, closed, it contains all of its boundary points. Bounded, it doesn't go out infinitely far. So we are guaranteed by the intermediate value theorem, ah, by the extreme value theorem, sorry, by the extreme value theorem that the continuous function that we've got for the temperature does attain a global maximum and a global minimum value on this set. But finding them, finding where they occur is something else. And so what do we do? Well, you look at the interior of the set, so ignore the boundary. At interior points, the, the, a local maximum or minimum can, can occur only at a critical point. Um, so that's where either the, the derivative, the total derivative doesn't exist, but this function is differentiable everywhere, or where the gradient vector is zero. So we'll take the gradient vector of this and set it equal to zero and find the interior critical points. What about the boundary? Well, technically, if you're looking at this function restricted to this set, the entire boundary consists of critical points because the total derivative's not defined because you can't even approach the point um, from these directions. So for technical reasons, the whole boundary consists of critical points, and so we have to deal with the boundary separately. But we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's find the interior critical points find interior critical points. Okay, so we're going to take, as I said, the total derivative of this exists everywhere, but, or not but, so we want to know where the gradient vector is zero, because those will be the only critical points. Uh, the partial of t with respect to x, 4x. Partial of t with respect to y, 4y minus 1. You set both of these equal to zero, and you solve simultaneously. You get x has to be zero, and y has to be a fourth. So this is one critical point, x is 0, y is a fourth. What do we do with that? Well, what we're going to do is, okay, that's the only interior, ah, I should say, this is in this region. It is in the, the plate that we're looking at. It's, it satisfies x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1, so it is in this region. If we had gotten x equals 0 and y equals 17, well, that would be outside the region we're considering, and there would be no critical points in the region. Yeah, this function, because it exists on a bigger set, um, would have a critical point at 0, 17, but restricted to this set, which is what we're looking at, it would have no critical points had this been x equals 0, y 17. But it's not. That is in there. And what we're going to do is now look for maximum. We're going to do the max min problem on the boundary, the optimization problem on the boundary, and get some points. And we'll take the points we get there and this point, put them in a, a table, just, and then plug them into the original function, into the temperature function, and just see where we get the biggest and smallest values for t. So that's how you proceed. So, all right, that's the only place on the interior where a global maximum or global minimum could occur. But what about on the boundary? Well, the boundary of the region is exactly where x squared plus y squared equals 1. So on the boundary, so that's where this is true, strictly speaking, we should use a different name for f. Uh, uh, yes, well, because there is no f. Strictly speaking, we should use a different name for t here. We should indicate t restricted to the boundary. But I'm just going to keep using t, but you need to understand we mean t restricted where x squared plus y squared 
equals 1. So um, a function is 2x squared plus 2y squared, but that's 2 times x squared plus y squared minus y. But now we're looking at points on the boundary. We're looking at points where this is true. So x squared plus y squared is just 1. And so this is 2 minus y. Now, the boundary itself of a compact set is compact. And so this isn't for all possible y. This is for y's that you can possibly have on the boundary. That's for y between minus 1 and 1. But now, this is a, a calculus a calculus one problem. You have this function of one variable on a closed bounded interval. You want to find where it attains a maximum minimum value. You look for critical points. It's the one-dimensional analog of what we were just doing. You look for critical points in the interior of this interval, so not including the endpoints. Um, so places where the derivative of this is zero that occur between minus one and one. Well, there aren't any because the derivative of this, and now you have to be careful. I really am restricted to this case where t is a function of y. As I said, technically I should use a different name for the function, but that gets cumbersome. So you just get as just a function of y, t prime of, maybe I'll, yeah, t prime is just minus 1. It has no critical points in the interior of the interval, but you still have to check the endpoints of the interval. So you still need to check what happens when y is minus 1 and y is 1. Hopefully you remember that from Calc 1. But what are the x's? Oh, to get the x's you have to come back up here and use this. If y is minus 1, then y squared is 1, so x squared would have to be 0. So x would have to be 0 if y is minus 1. And if y is 1, again x would have to be 0. So we get two new pairs two new points that we have to check. So we've just found that there are only three places where the global maximum minimum of this temperature function can occur. There's our one interior critical point, which was 0, 1 fourth. There, and then there were these two points on the boundary. x is 0, y is minus 1 x is 0 and y is 1. And our function, t, is x squared plus 2y squared minus y. And what you do at this point is just plug these in and see where t is the biggest and t is the smallest. These are the only places where the global maximum, global minimum can occur. So now you just check. Um, in all three cases, x is 0, so this part is 0. Here we get 2 times 1 fourth squared is 1 sixteenth minus a fourth. So this is one-eighth minus two-eighths. So minus an eighth. At zero minus one, you get, well, zero. And then at minus one, you get this squared. So you get um, zero plus two, and then minus minus one, so plus one. So you get three. And at 0, 1, at 0, 1, you get x is 0, y is 1, you get 2 minus 1, you get 1. And then you just look, oh, what's the biggest? It's 3. What's the smallest? Uh, negative 1 eighth. So the, the answer to the question, you know, find the, what we're supposed to find, find the hottest and coldest points on the plate, the coldest point on the plate is at 0, 1 fourth, um, and there the temperature is minus 1 eighth degrees Celsius. And the hottest point on the plate, which isn't very hot, is at 0, minus 1, so that's a point on the boundary, and the temperature there is 3 degrees Celsius. Okay, well that's a first example. You always have to check, if there's boundary, you have to check it separately. If there's not boundary, you really can't be appealing to the extreme value theorem to know you have a global maximum and minimum, so there better be some physical considerations that help you. Um, I want to change this problem and look at it 
again, but where I change where the plate is and the shape of the plate. So uh, in that respect, it's not the same problem. But I want to change the plate to where it occupies a triangular region. Here's one, here's one. This line is x plus y equals one. And I want to suppose that the plate occupies this triangular region in the first quadrant bounded by the x-axis, the y-axis, and x plus y equals one. So there are th the problem, the big problem here is going to be that there will now be three boundary pieces that we have to deal with separately. We're not going to be able to handle them all, all at once. So what do you do to find, you still want to find the hottest and coldest points on the plate. I'm assuming I've still got the same temperature function, but now on this plate. Well, at the interior points, you do what we did before. You find where the derivative's undefined, but that's nowhere. I mean, the total derivative. Uh, then you want to find where the gradient is zero. So you do exactly what we did before. You find this one critical point. Is that actually in the region? So x is, x is zero, y is a fourth. Sure, that is in the region, but it's, it's already on the boundary. Well, we were going to have to check the boundary separately anyway, so you can list it now or you can list it later, but um, that critical point already occurs on the boundary, so we are I mean, we're going to have to check the boundary separately. So now what do we do on the boundary? Well, there are three pieces to it, and so we have to do three different pieces of the boundary. By the way, you may, you may wonder, well, yeah, the point zero one fourth occurs on the boundary, but do I really have to check it? Well, we'll see, but it wouldn't hurt to check one extra point. It's not like it'll give you anything wrong. It's like, oh my God, what if I check zero one fourth and it's not a place where the maximum minimum could have occurred? Well, that you won't get the biggest or smallest value. It's not a big deal. So, all right, here we are. Uh, let me... Draw the region again. Just, I know it's easy, but all right. So this part, the x-axis, is where y is 0. This part, the y-axis, is where x is 0. And this part is where x plus y equals 1. So we have to do, and our function, t, hasn't changed. It's still 2 times x squared plus 2 times y squared minus y. Um, all right, but now you have to check three different boundary pieces. So on y equals zero, so the x-axis, when y is zero, well, this is one and this is one, so it's still true that, well, that x is between zero and one. On y equals zero, x is less than or equal to one, so that's that line segment. When y is zero, our function collapses to, if y is 0, that's 0 and that's 0, to 2x squared. And so we have to do the one variable max min problem from Calc 1, maximize and minimize the function 2x squared on the interval from 0 to 1. Well, you take the derivative. Now I mean with respect to x. You set it equal to 0 and you solve, you get x equals 0. Well, we were going to have to check x equals 0 anyway because it's the balance one of the boundary points of this interval. So, but that's the only place we have to check um, on that line segment. So we'll check um, or the only points when x is 0 and x is 1, um, and y is 0 both times. So we have to check, what is that? We have to check 0, 0, and 1, 0. Well, that's no surprise. 0, 0 is here. 1, 0 is here. You're always going to have to check corners if your boundary has corners. So we have to check these two points. Um, what else do we have to check? Well, then there's on x equals 0. So when x equals 0, you're on this line segment. Well, of course, we're going to get again that you have to check 0, 0. You don't have to check it twice. But, and also, the critical point we found earlier, 0 fourth is on here. So 
we don't have check zero fourth unless this the calculation we're about to do tells us that we have to. Um, when x is zero, um, you will have y is between zero and one. Right? X is zero, the y's here on the boundary are between zero and one. T just becomes when x is zero, you get t becomes two y squared minus y. We need to do the one variable calculus problem, find the the maximum minimum values of this function on this interval. So what do you do? You take the derivative. Now the prime here means with respect to y, 4y minus 1. You set this equal to 0 and solve. And it's not surprising. You get y equals a fourth. Well, so yeah, we're gonna, we got x equals 0, y equals a fourth again. So yes, we have to check that. 0 fourth. There's one point we have to check, and of course we have to check the endpoints of this interval when y is 0 and y is 1 and x is 0 both times. So again, we get 0, 0, um, but we also get when x is 0 and y is 1, so we also get 0, 1. So we have to check these points. Um, we already had 0, 0. Finally, we have to check, maybe I'll try to fit it right here we have to check on x plus y equals 1. And then if we write everything in terms of y, once again, we'll have that y is between 0 and 1. Or if we write everything in terms of x, x is between 0 and 1. So we're on the part of the boundary now where, where x plus y equals 1. So we'll write this as we'll, it's easiest in the original function to replace the x's, so x is 1 minus y. And then our function, which was 2x squared plus 2y squared minus y, well, x squared, so you get 2 times x squared is now 1 minus y, 1 minus y quantity squared. Then plus a 2y squared minus y. And everything's in terms of y, but we know that the y even on this line segment, has to be between 0 and 1. All right, so again, we have the one variable problem, but it looks a little messier. We have to find where this function attains maximum minimum values on this closed interval, so this closed bounded interval. So of course, you'll check the endpoints again, but we already have all of those. Um, when y is 0, you'll get x equals 1. So we have to check 1, 0, but we already had that. When y is 1, you'll get, uh, what did I just say? When, when y is 0, you'll get x equals 1, and we already had that one. And when y is 1, you'll get x equals 0, and we already had that one. So we don't need to add more to a list. And in fact, we didn't need to add that one a second time. But we do need to know if this function has a critical point in the interior of that. So you have to take the derivative one more time. You get a 4 times y minus 1, and then by the chain rule, times an extra of minus 1, plus 4y um, minus 1. Uh, so I'm going to distribute this minus sign, so you get a plus and a minus. So we get 4y minus 4 plus 4y minus 1 equals 0. This is 8y, 8y minus 5 equals 0. So y equals 5 eighths. If we had gotten y equals 8 fifths, it would be outside this range and we wouldn't care. But 5 eighths is between 0 and 1. So this is a place we have to check. And the x-coordinate that corresponds to that, we're on we're on the line segment where x plus y equals 1. So if y is 5 eighths, x is 3 eighths. So, so yeah, these, these problems can get a little long, uh, but they're not so bad. So what do you do at this point? Maybe I won't finish it, but what do you do? What do you do what we did before? We now have our list of points that we want to check. You've got your xy pairs, 
And you've got your function t, which is 2x squared plus 2y squared minus y. <coughs> and what points do we have to check? Well, we're going to check 0, 1 fourth, 0, 0, all the points we accumulated along the way. Um, 1, 0, we already have 0, a fourth, 0, 1, so those are the corners, and then the one extra point, 3 eighths, 5 eighths. All right, so those are all the points we need to check, unless I missed one. Oh, got them all. Um, you can plug them in. You could use a calculator or not. Well, maybe I will finish. Or at least when x is 0, you'll get 2 times, and then you get a fourth squared minus a fourth. When x is 0 and y is 0, you get 0. When x is 1 and y is 0, you get 2. When x is 0 and y is 1, you get 0 and 2 minus 1, so you get 1. And now the complicated one, oh, I could have done this one. This is what we got before. This is 1 16th times 2, so an 8th minus 2 eighths, so this is minus an 8th. Then this is the harder one to do by hand because it has 8's in it. You get 2 times 3 eighths squared plus 2 times 5 eighths squared minus 5 eighths. So either you can work that out or do it on your calculator and then you just look for the, the biggest and the, the smallest values. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and work it out since it, I decided it would bother me just to leave this hanging. But um, you get 2 times 9 sixty-fourths plus 2 times 25 sixty-fourths. And since we'll want everything in sixty-fourths, I'll make this minus 40 sixty-fourths. And so we get 50, 68 minus 40. So 28 sixty-fourths. You can divide the numerator and denominator by 4 if you want and get 7 sixteenths. So where is the function the biggest? So where do we have the highest temperature? Uh, it looks like these are out of line. Looks like it's occurring at 1, 0, where the temperature is 2 degrees Celsius. And the smallest is where it was the smallest before. It's 0, 1 fourth where the temperature is minus an eighth. All right. So in general, this is what happens for functions on closed bounded regions. You look for interior critical points, and hopefully have a finite list of those, or at least a list of them where the corresponding number of values is finite. And then you have to check boundary points separately somehow. And if the boundary's in pieces, you have to check each piece separately. And if it's, if it's something nice like a circle, you can parameterize it or use the equation for the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 1, like we used. Um, and then so you find, you find this, these lists of, place, of points that you have to check. And then you just plug them all into your function and see where the function is the biggest and where the function is the smallest. These have been two variable examples, and I'm going to do two more two variable examples, although for a while it'll look like they're, um, well, I take that back. I'm going to do one three variable example, but another two variable example. But the, the examples I'm going to do next are not on closed bounded regions, and you might wonder what you do in those higher dimensional cases. Like, suppose you had a rectangular solid and a function on the rectangular solid giving you the temperature. Then the boundary consists of the six faces of the rectangular solid. What do you do? You have to consider those six faces separately and restrict your function to each of the six faces and do the two-dimensional max-min problem, optimization problem, on each of those rectangular faces. Yeah, it's painful, but you could do it if you had to. Um, but what I'm about, so I will I will look at more complicated examples in the more depth part of the section. But right now what I'm going to do is look at a couple of problems where we'll just appeal to your intuition that there is a global minimum for both of the problems we're about to look at. 
and um, we'll find one critical point. And since the global minimum has to occur at a critical point, that critical point will be where the global minimum occurs. Um, yeah, so let's do that. All right, so I want the problem, so another example. Find the point on the plane given by 2x plus y minus z equals 1. Which is closest to? Zero, one, three. All right. So as I said, we're not looking, well, first of all, it may not be clear to you what the function is, but we're just going to appeal to the fact that, yeah, if you've got a plane and you take a point, well, if the point's already on the plane, the closest point on the plane is the point itself, but if you've got a point and it's not lying on a plane, there is a closest point on the plane, and now we're going to We looked at similar problems to this earlier when we were just doing vectors and orthogonal projections and planes, but now we want to do this as an optimization problem. You just want, you want to minimize the distance function. So what does this mean? It means we look at, we look at the function d, which is the square root of so we're going to look at points on this plane. So this is supposed to be my picture of that plane. I'm in no way, shape, or form trying to draw it in the right spot. We need to take the distance from points on the plane to this point. Well, that's the x-coordinate of the point minus the x-coordinate of that point squared plus the y-coordinate of the point minus the y-coordinate of that point squared plus the z-coordinate of the point minus the z-coordinate of that point squared. And you take the square root where x, y, and z They can't vary independently, or I'll use the word constrained. So they are, this means they're not allowed to vary independently because they always have to satisfy constrained by 2x plus y minus z equals 1. So then there are two things that we do to simplify this problem. Um, when we get to a later section on the Lagrange multipliers will look at functions and constraints and we'll have another way of dealing with such a thing. But right now, what we want to do is solve for one of the variables here, like z, and put it in here and then say, ah, now x and y are allowed to vary independently. Right? Because when we look for, um, when we take partial derivatives, or you know, the total derivative, but partial derivatives, gradients, it's important that we can let some, some variables change while others are held fixed. That's what a partial derivative is. So you need to let all the independent variables remain constant. Well, so we need the, <laughs> we need the variables to be independent, but right now x, y, and z can't vary independently because if you change x and y, that determines z. So we'll replace z so that x and y be independent. So what we want to do, we want to minimize the distance function. But the other big simplification that we do is if you minimize the distance, well, that's the same that occurs at the same point if where the distance squared would be a minimum. 
And if we square the distance, we get rid of that nasty square root on the outside. So we're going to minimize distance squared. And I'll keep writing it as d squared so we won't forget. We could call it some other name. So we're going to minimize this function, but But I'll say again, we're going to replace the z variable. We're going to solve for z in terms of x and y. z is 2x plus y minus 1. All right. So you put that in, and you get, in terms of x and y, so what we really want is x squared plus y minus 1 squared plus this, where z is, so that is 2x plus y minus 4 squared. And this is what we're going to minimize. Now x and y are allowed to vary independently. We are not on a closed bounded set. So we are not guaranteed that this function has a global maximum, global minimum. In fact, it doesn't have a global maximum. There are points arbitrarily far away from the plane. So it can't have a global maximum. But yeah, we're just appealing to intuition. There is a closest point, and it will have to occur at a critical point. So if we only find one critical point, that's where, where we want to be. So now you take the partial derivative with respect to x. That is 2x plus 2 times 2x plus y minus 4, and then by the chain rule, times an extra 2. So maybe I'll multiply that right here. So we get this. We're going to set this equal to 0. And at the same time, we need to set the partial with respect to y equal to 0. And that is 2 times y minus 1 plus 2 times 2 times 2x plus y minus 4. Um, and then with respect to y, we don't get anything extra from the chain rule. So we need both of these set equal to 0 at the same time, and then we need to solve simultaneously. All right, so we get, let's just expand this, we get 2x plus 8x plus 4y minus 16 equals 0. Uh, 2x, I'm just checking myself, plus 8x plus 4y minus 16 equals 0, yes, and 2y minus 2 plus 4x plus 2y minus 8 equals 0. So x's, we get 10x here plus 4y, and then I'll put the 16 on the other side, equals 16. And down here we get 4x, 4x, and we get plus 4y, And you get a minus 2, minus 8, so minus 10, but put that on the other side, equals 10. Okay, so that's what we get, and you solve these simultaneously. The easiest thing to do, they both have four y's in them, or the easiest thing that I see is just subtract them and the reference to the y's will drop out. Take this equation and subtract this one, and you get 6x. There, you can solve two equations in two unknowns lots of ways, so if you want to do it some other way, that's fine. Since the four y's are both sitting there, you'll get 6x equals 16 minus 10 equals 6. x equals 1. And then you can plug into either one of these and get what y is. If x is 1, then, for instance, this would say um, 4y equals 6, so y is 3 halves. So, okay. Um, so, what does that tell us? That should be the x and y coordinates of the point that minimizes the distance squared. But that'll be minimize the distance. Well, we wanted the point that was closest. How, where's the z-coordinate? We have to go back and use our constraint. Right? We had 
2x plus y minus z equals 1. And now you have to solve for z. Or so when we plugged in, in fact, we had already rearranged this. This is z is 2x plus y minus 1. So the z coordinate that we're after is 2 times x, that's 2, plus 3 halves, minus 1. In terms, writing everything in terms of halves, you've got 4 halves plus 3 halves minus 2 halves, so 5 halves. So the point on the plane closest to um, 0, 1, 3, x equals 1, y equals 3 halves, z equals 5 halves. So even though my picture almost surely isn't in the right place, we're getting x is 1, y is 3 halves, and z is 5 halves. All right. I want to do one last problem, kind of the most applied problem of the ones we've looked at. It's kind of a classic, uh, you know, here's a, we want to build a cardboard box. We want it to hold this amount of volume. We don't want it to have a top. What should its dimensions be to use the least amount of cardboard in making the box? So um, let's look at that problem. It's just kind of a classic style of word problem, modeling problem. It always used to be called word problems. Calling them modeling problems is the more modern, <laughs> modern in the last 25 years. It's, I'm very fashionable to refer to these as modeling problems. <laughs> so we want a cardboard box with no top to hold <coughs> Four thousand cubic inches. All right. The question is, what should the dimensions of the box be? the amount of cardboard used. Right? If you were constructing a box to hold a certain volume, this is what you'd want to do to minimize the amount of cardboard used. Once again, we're going to have a problem that is not defined on a compact set when we or not have a function. When we write down the function that we'll need to, to minimize, right, we're going to minimize the surface area, so the area of the sides of the box. You're going to see that there's no way to consider it as being on a closed bounded region. So we are once again appealing to intuition. Um, that there is kind of a minimum amount of cardboard that you can use, and it would occur, and, and so it has to occur at the only critical point that we'll find. I should say you can do more complicated analyses you can, um, to show, in fact, that you do have a global maximum or minimum. You can kind of take a really big closed bounded region and um, and then do the max min problem on that, and then show that outside there, the function always gets bigger. But that's hard. Um, we're not going to look at that. We're just going to appeal to intuition. But you should know that you, there are things you could do if you didn't want to appeal to intuition. They're just extremely complicated. So um, what's the problem? We have, by a, a box, we mean a rectangular box. Didn't explicitly say that, but that's what's intended. So you've got some rectangular box. It has some width, some length, and some height. Um, I'll 
W, L, and H. So what we're told is that we want W times L times H to be 4,000 because W times L times H is the volume and we want the volume to be 4,000 cubic inches. So this is not what we're trying to maximize or minimize. This is a constraint just like the equation for the plane gave us a constraint in the last problem. This is a constraint. It tells you that W, L, and H are not allowed to vary independently. And we're going to solve for one of these and eliminate it in the function that we're about to write so that we're dealing with a problem in which all our variables can vary independently. What is it we're trying to maximize or minimize? We're trying to minimize the surface area. Now, it's important to remember that the box has no top, so the area is, all right, you've got this side and its twin back in the back, and that's the area of that side is W times H, so you've got two of those, two WH. And then you've got two of these, so that's two, this one and the one over here, two times LH, but you don't have a top on the box, so the only other area is, is the bottom. It's coming from the bottom. So it's one times <coughs> one times L times W. So this is the area. Well, you may wonder in this problem, why is there no top on the box? Because if there were a top on the box, the, box, the problem would be completely symmetric in terms of L, W, and H, and you could probably guess that L, W, and H should all be the same, so they should all be the cube root of 4,000. And that's just too easy, so we left the top off the box. So this is the function that we want to minimize, the area function, 2WH plus 2LH plus 1LW, since there's no top. But it's subject to this constraint, which stops LH and W from varying independently. So we will solve for H. So we'll write H is 4,000 over WL. Then we'll replace the H here and the H there. And then we'll have an area function just in terms of L and W. And L and W will now be allowed to vary independently. So we can just look for critical points. There's no boundary. There won't be a boundary anywhere. Um, and see that we only find one critical point. When I say there's no boundary, it's because we don't want any of the dimensions to be zero. We wouldn't have a box. So it's not that L and W are greater than or equal to zero. They have to be straighter, strictly greater than zero, especially since we solve for H and we've got 4,000 divided by W times L. We can't let L or W be zero. So you take your area function, but every time you've got the H in it, we replace it, the H, by 4,000 divided by WL. And we had a 2LH, but that's 2L times 4,000 divided by W times L. And then we have plus W times L. Um, you can write this more neatly. A W cancels here, um, and you get... 8,000, so we get 8,000, um, let me just write 8,000 L to the minus, times L to the minus 1. So divided by L, but I'll write it's times L. Then we get a plus another 8,000. Now the L's cancel, and you get times W to the minus 1, and then plus W L. All right. Um, we are just on the open region where... W is greater than zero, L is greater than zero, there's no boundary, we're, we're appealing to intuition, that this does have a global minimum, <laughs> and we'll find there's only one critical point, and that better be where the global minimum occurs. So, a partial derivative, so we look for critical points. The, these, the, this function is differentiable every place where L and W are greater than zero, so we just Take the partial derivative, set them equal to zero, and solve simultaneously. We get minus 8,000 L to the minus 2 um, plus W 
we want that to be zero. And you take the partial of A with respect to W, and you get minus 8,000 times W to the minus 2 um, plus L equals zero. So what do we get? Well, we have to solve these simultaneously. So this line says that W equals 8,000 divided by L squared. And this line says L equals 8,000 divided by W squared. And we need to solve um, for L and W. Well, there are lots of ways you could proceed, but I'm just going to do kind of the naive. I'm going to plug this L in right there and get a fairly ugly expression, but then it'll simplify and we'll be able to solve. So, um, so these are what we're trying to solve simultaneously, maybe with very bad board. No, I won't. I'll go over here. So we've got W equals 8,000 over L squared, and L equals 8,000 over W squared. We want to solve for L and W. Um, plug this in here. You get W equals 8,000 divided by L squared, 8,000 over W squared squared. All right. So you get 8,000 squared in the denominator divided by w to the fourth, but when you invert and multiply that w to the fourth ends up in the numerator, and you get 8,000 divided by 8,000 squared, so divided by 8,000. So w equals w to the fourth divided by 8,000. Um, w is not zero, so we can divide both sides by w and conclude that one equals w cubed over 8,000, or what's the same thing, w cubed is 8,000. So W is the cube root of 8,000, and conveniently, this is a perfect cube. Uh, 1,000 is 10 cubed, and 8 is 2 cubed, so this is W equals 20. Um, great. W equals 20. Um, uh, our units are inches. We were in cubic inches, so W is definitely in inches, so this is 20 inches. Um, you can now solve for L. Not surprisingly, it comes out to be the same if W is 20. W squared is 400, 8,000 divided by 400, 20. So L is also 20 inches. The problem was completely symmetric in W and L, so that shouldn't be surprising. And then um, H, how do you find H? Here's our constraint. Uh, w is 20. L is 20, so this is 400, divided by this, H is 10, so H is half. Right, so that's it. Those are the dimensions of the box that uses the least cardboard. Um, it's, uh, you could ask, well, what is that smallest amount of cardboard? Ah, we didn't actually look at that, you'd have to evaluate the area function now, right? You could, since we have it back in terms of W, L, and H, you can put the area function back in terms of that. We had two times, oh, we had W, we had, yeah, I'm going to fit it in right there, L and H. We had um, two times W, H plus two times LH, plus a single LW. And I didn't ask, but if you were asking, and what are the dimensions, and what is that minimum amount of cardboard that's used, then you have to calculate this. It's, you know, just, it just depends on what you're asked. It's, this would be 20 times 10, plus two times 20 times 10, 
plus L times W, which is 20 times 20. So you get 400 plus 400 plus 400, so 1,200 square inches. And that's what you get. Um, all right. Uh, those are just some examples. Um, you treat max-min problems, optimization problems in this way. If, if you have more variables, the problem's harder. If you've got boundary, because then you have to check all these higher dimensional boundary pieces. Um, so that can be a nightmare. If uh, you have too strange of a physical problem, um, analyzing what happens on the boundary or even deciding what the boundary is can be a problem. There, there are lots of problems, optimization problems, that are hard. Um, but the general technique is what we've looked at. If you've got a continuous function on a compact region, you look for interior critical points and then you have to analyze the boundary separately. If you don't have any boundary, then you're almost certainly just appealing to physical intuition that there is a global maximum or a global minimum. And then you better only find one critical point. So those problems are easier if you're willing to believe your intuition. Um, you better just find one critical point, and that would be where the global maximum or global minimum occurs.